I um, am going to give you uh, the latest installment in this uh, story that uh, Fred and, uh, and John and Christian started uh, now about 30 years or so ago. Uh, but before I, I, I begin the talk, first of all, I want to congratulate Irfan on the uh, inauguration of this wonderful center and uh, thank him very much for the opportunity to uh, speak at this wonderful symposium in honor of, uh, of John Clark. Now, I was a, uh, a grad student in John's group in the late 80s, or sorry, late 90s, early 2000s, and um, I wasn't working on, uh, on uh, quantum information or quantum science. Uh, my project uh, involved constructing an MRI system uh, that involved a squid detector for operation in very low field. And uh, it was a great project. I learned a ton about uh, superconducting devices, noise, building systems. Uh, but you know, one of the really nice uh, aspects of my uh, tenure as a, a Berkeley grad student is, was the opportunity to, to interact with uh, Erwin Hahn. And I think that it was uh, very fitting that at the beginning of this uh, meeting yesterday, the, uh, one of the organizers uh, specifically highlighted Hahn's enormous contributions to uh, magnetic resonance and to uh, uh, quantum science. And uh, one of the wonderful traditions in Berkeley physics, which I hope is uh, you know, maintained to this day, is the departmental T. It has uh, eh, sort of fallen, uh, lapsed a little bit. Well, uh, you know, when I was a grad student, it was, I think, 4 o'clock. People would gather up on the fourth floor of Lacan. And uh, you know, no matter what uh, I was doing in the lab, I would head up there. and. Uh, Erwin Hahn was a regular, and it was wonderful to interact with him. He had the most amazing stories about uh, Felix Bloch. He had a great story about a meeting he'd had with Albert Einstein. And uh, so he was a source of these amazing stories, but also uh, we would have some technical and scientific discussions, and it was just uh, you know, remarkable to hear him talk about uh, magnetic resonance and uh, refocusing and polarization transfer. And of course, spin one half nucleus, this is a prototypical qubit. And so, you know, a lot of what uh, we talk about stuck with me. And, uh, you know, later on in my career, as I moved in the quantum information direction, some of these little uh, statements that Irwin had made in passing sort of came back and uh, really uh, were, were useful for me. So, uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Irwin's uh, amazing contributions, and it's, uh, I was very sad to hear of his recent passing. Uh, but of course, the bulk of my graduate education happened uh, not up in the, the tea room in Lacan Hall, but rather down in the second basement of Burge Hall. That's where the hard work got done. And uh, previous speakers have uh, talked about uh, John's wonderful uh, style of leadership and mentoring, and uh, it's, it's a style that I try to emulate in my own career as a, a university professor now in uh, Wisconsin. You know, every day at the end of the day, I knew that John would come through, and so over the course of the day as I was trying to get things to work, uh, you know, I'd, I'd come up with a sort of mental bullet list of, uh, you know, what, what are the problems, what am I gonna talk to John about, you know, what, what are my proposed ways to uh, kind of move ahead and make progress? And we'd talk, and it, it, were, it were great discussions, and we would always, you know, agree on a, on a, a way forward and, and chart a path to progress. And uh, it, was a, it was a tremendously rewarding experience to work in John's group. Well, uh, as I say, this was the late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, you know, at that time, there were these wonderful experiments that were being done in Delft, at NEC uh, on uh, these macroscopic quantum systems, first observations of quantum coherence in these engineered systems. And right across the hall in the B275, uh, John was building up a flux qubit effort with Britton Plourd, and I was very fortunate to overlap with Dale when he came and visited uh, uh, Berkeley on sabbatical. And uh, even though I wasn't involved in that work, it was uh, you know, tremendously rewarding for me to kind of be on the periphery of that and to hear these discussions about qubits and uh, you know, noise and the connection between noise and decoherence. And it just seemed like such a fascinating area to me. I knew that this is what I wanted to move into when I uh, graduated from John's group. 
And so, uh, uh, you know, after I got my, my degree, I went on and I uh, joined uh, John Martinez at, uh, at uh, NIST. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of getting away from my outline here. So, you know, I've got a, I've got a technical talk here, and I'm, I think I'm going to go a little bit light on the technical detail, but I'm going to tell you about the, uh, you know, some of the progress we've made on this problem that uh, Fred introduced. But, you know, throughout, I think I'm going to be interspersing some... Uh, uh, personal recollections and little stories. And uh, so if people want to talk to me about the, the gritty technical details, by all means, find me afterwards. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, so there was this amazing work uh, on qubits going on in, uh, in John's group. I wanted to be a part of that. And uh, another uh, important uh, education that I, that I got in, in, in John's group. We, you know, we looked at all the uh, beautiful past works that had been done over the, the decades on MQT, the amazing work from, uh, from Fred. And, uh, you know, I wasn't directly involved in this uh, problem of low frequency noise when I was working in John's group, but I was certainly aware of it. And uh, I was actually fortunate to end up with the last hard copy of Fred Wellstood's thesis that had been floating around in the, in the Clark group. Uh, and I, I have it to this day. It's a, a pretty weighty tome. And I've, uh, I have gone through it cover to cover. And at certain points over the last 10 years, uh, I've, I've gone through some of the sections quite closely. And uh, so I knew that there was this problem. And it was a, a big mystery. And uh, you know, at the time, I wasn't involved. But it's, I sort of filed it away in the back of my mind. And you know, w what could possibly be the source of this noise? And now it was something that was uh, really relevant to the qubits that uh, John Clark, John Martinez, and others around the world were trying to build. And so there was some motivation to try to figure this out. And so uh, you know, as I say, I, I, I moved from Berkeley first to NIST and then to Santa Barbara, where I worked with uh, John Martinez. And so this was 2003 when I joined the Martinez group. And so, uh, you know, at that time, there was no big industrial scale effort. It was Martinez himself and a couple of uh, scruffy postdocs. And it's amazing how little we knew at that time. And it was a, a ton of fun. We knew so little that we were learning really, really quickly. And uh, it gave me a, a great opportunity to interact very closely one-on-one -on -one with uh, Martinez. And at that time, he was spending a ton of time himself in the lab. And um, one, I'm going to digress a little again here. One uh, story that I, I remember is, uh, for some reason, uh, Martinez and I were working together in the NIST clean room uh, kind of late at night. And uh, I think we were both kind of punchy. We were trying to get something done, and we were tired. And we, we got into this sort of uh, philosophical mode, and we were talking kind of about the sociology of the field, and it was uh, an entertaining conversation. And uh, uh, at one point, Martinez uh, asked me, so, you know, Robert, we get along uh, pretty well. Uh, uh, do you know why that is? And I was like, no, no I, I don't know. Why do you think that is, John? And uh, he said that it's because we're both trained by John Clark. We're both John Clark students. And I don't remember the, you know, the exact details of the, uh, of the argument, but I think the, the basic gist was, you know, what we're trying to do is so hard, make these qubits work, uh, you know, build up a, a system that shows quantum coherence over multiple qubits and, and make that work properly and understand all of the physics. It's so hard, there's an infinite number of ways to screw things up. And maybe not only one way to get it right, but really probably only a small handful of ways to get things right. And what we both learned from John Clark was how to do things right. And we've heard over the course of the last couple of days a lot about the you know, specific scientific advances and research accomplishments to come out of the Clark Group. Uh, and we've heard a little bit about this, but I, I think even more important than all of the amazing scientific progress and results and papers uh, from, from John Clark's group is the fact that he was able to 
uh, you know, pass on to this generation of students this wonderful scientific culture? You know, how do you identify critical problems? Uh, you know, what is the, the method of attack that you take to solve those problems? How do you come up with a clean experiment and then, you know, find a nice, real, physical way to explain what's going on? And this is, uh, this is what, you know, I think I, I've learned some of and John Mart Martinez has learned some of. And everyone in this field, it's amazing how everybody has some connection to John Clark and his, uh, you know, fingerprints and influences are all over this superconducting qubit field. And so we all owe uh, John a tremendous debt. Uh, so anyway, that was a little digression. So let's, let's talk about some technical stuff. So, uh, so I was working with John Martinez and you know, at that time, we were working on phase qubits. Those devices had a lot of problems. Energy relaxation was the main problem. But you know, we also saw that there was this dephasing. And early on, we realized that dephasing of the qubits uh, was connected to this mysterious flux noise that Fred Wellstood uh, had first studied uh, back in the 80s. So while uh, I was uh, with Martinez, this is now at UCSB, we did uh, some experiments that you know, oh, directly measured the, the power spectral density of the flux noise on a phase qubit circuit. And so this is a big device, sort of 100 micron in scale. And we saw levels of flux noise that are pretty compatible with what Fred had seen in his squid uh, measurements. And what's very striking is that on uh, very different devices measured in, uh, in Delft or in NEC, very similar levels of flux noise were seen, despite the orders of magnitude difference in scale in these devices. And so this apparent scale independence or universality of this noise uh, is striking, but it absolutely connects with this earlier work from uh, Fred Wellstood. And uh, it, it was a mystery. And you know, since then, uh, there have been some very beautiful experiments by uh, Irfan's group, by the Lincoln group, and Google that show that this noise is persisting not just over a couple of decades in frequency, but over many, many decades, 13 or so decades in frequency. And it's, it's a remarkable physical phenomenon. You, you get this very clean 1 over F spectrum over many, many decades. And there are probably not many physical phenomena in, in nature that give you this clean power law over such a broad, broad range. So uh, this was an open question, and it was a difficult question. And uh, you know, in 2006, I moved to uh, University of Wisconsin to set up a, a lab. And uh, you, know, you, ha you have to find uh, good problems to work on that no one else is working on. You have to find your little niche. And uh, so I decided I would try to tackle this problem, mainly because nobody else was doing it, I think because the rest of the community had decided that this was just, you know, a total pain. You know, you didn't want to get near this problem. And so uh, uh, I, I had a little, uh, you know, chance to try to do something that nobody else was doing. And uh, I came up with a research proposal. We were going to investigate all these different sources and quasi-particles and vortices. Uh, the, the problem is that Fred Wellstood had ruled out almost all of these potential sources of noise. So, you know, I don't know where that research proposal would have gone, but uh, in, in the end, I got totally lucky. Uh, the starting point of any of our investigations was basically just to kind of measure the noise, kind of duplicate what Fred had done. So we put together the exact same experiment that he'd done back in the 80s where we current bias a squid, and then we uh, read it out with, uh, uh, or sorry, we voltage bias a squid, read it out with a second stage squid as a sensitive preamplifier, and we measure the flux fluctuations in that way. And so, of course, we see this 1 over F uh, noise spectrum. We can fit to that, and we measure the levels of flux noise, quite similar to what Fred had seen. Okay, but uh, you know, how do we how do we get a handle on where this noise is coming from? Well, this is where uh, you know luck intervened. And uh, we were doing these experiments in an adiabatic DMAG fridge. And uh, Fred's experiments were done in a dilution fridge. One of the nice things about an ADR is you can very rapidly change temperature of the cold stage. And so what we would do is we would ramp up and down in temperature. And we would have the uh, I phi curve just displayed on an oscilloscope as we were uh, adjusting and going to our next temperature point. And, you know, kind of quite by chance, we happen to you know, be looking at the scope and paying into attention. 
And we saw that as we changed the temperature, this I phi curve would shift. And as we got colder, uh, this uh, change of the flux with temperature would kind of take off. And so, uh, you know, what is that? Is there some crosstalk between the ADR magnet and our squid measurement setup? Uh, we investigated uh, more closely. And in the end, the experiment that we did that really kind of nailed this down was we intentionally trapped vortices in the thin films of our devices, uh, locked the squid flux lock loop at a high temperature, it cooled the low temperature, and then plotted the temperature dependent uh, flux change as we varied temperature. And we saw a very clear uh, 1 over t Curie like divergence of the quasi static flux threading the squid loop. So it was it just total luck that we uh, happened to notice this temperature-dependent flux. We followed up on it. Uh, the, the flux change here scales linearly with the density of trapped vortices. And I won't go into the detail. So 1 over t behavior immediately makes you think of spins, paramagnetic impurities. And with a you know, small amount of modeling, you can extract a surface density of paramagnetic defects. And uh, this is the number you get. And it's something like uh, one Bohr magneton every nanometer, roughly. And this number was you know, shocking to me. It probably shouldn't have been shocking, because the previous year, uh, Roger Koch, John Clark, and David DiVincenzo had published a paper indicating that uh, paramagnetic spins with this density, exactly this density, could account for the observed flux noise. You know, I read the paper, but at the time, that number just seemed impossibly large. You know, one more magneton every nanometer seemed uh, crazy, probably because, you know, I was thinking about dielectric TLS, which are much more dilute, and we thought, okay, maybe there's some connection between dielectric TLS and these uh, spin impurities. But uh, now we had a, an actual measured number. And this was great because, uh, you know, there's been this 30-year problem, this huge open question. Now we had some kind of handle. We had a, a rough idea of what might be going on, and uh, this sort of pointed a direction forward. So that observation and uh, some others from uh, Cam Muller's group and other places kind of pointed uh, a, a direction forward. And there were some interesting theory developments from uh, Faro and Yoffe and uh, here at Berkeley. Uh, in uh, the group of uh, John and Steve Louie, there was a theory about how metal-induced gap states might give rise to this uh, high density of spins. And over the next few years, my group did some more experiments that uh, you know, revealed some of the more uh, unusual properties of the noise, correlations between susceptibility and magnetization fluctuations. But there was a, a pretty good stretch where uh, you know, we were learning some new things about this mysterious noise, but we still didn't have an idea of what exactly these microscopic defects were. And uh, critically, for uh, qubit practitioners, we didn't have a, a way to reduce the noise. And uh, so I think the next big step forward for, uh, for our group happened uh, uh, maybe two, three years ago. And it actually grew out of a suggestion from Dave Pappas. So, you know, I wanted to find a way to uh, try to identify this magnetism. <clears throat> and uh, so we needed an element specific probe of surface magnetism. And there aren't many techniques out there uh, that fit the bill. Maybe STM is one, but that's a really hard technique. and. Uh, you know, spin polarized STM, not many people are doing that. So Dave uh, suggested this uh, X-ray technique, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. You're using circular polarized X-rays to probe at specific X-ray absorption edges. So you get elemental specificity from the X-ray frequency. And then by doing a different spectrum, left and, circular, left and right circularly polarized X-rays, you can probe magnetism. So we put together a little user proposal. We ended up getting some beam time at Argon. And uh, at that time, uh, you know, I was thinking, I think most people in the community were thinking that the magnetism is happening at the interface between the superconductor and its native oxide. Um, we were thinking in terms of some RKKY coupling between these defects to give you the, you know, the broad distribution of characteristic times that you need for 1 over F noise. But in fact, what we found is we saw no evidence of magnetism until we 
uh, intentionally degraded the vacuum environment of the samples we were looking at at this uh, end station at, uh, at Oregon. And uh, when we started to bleed in air or molecular oxygen at the level of about 10 to the minus 8 tor, when we got below about uh, 50 Kelvin or so, we started to see a very clear X-ray absorption figure uh, signature at the oxygen K edge, uh, which we uh, you know, later identified using DFT uh, as adsorb molecular O2, and we saw a clear uh, XMCD signal. So um, there's very clear evidence of uh, magnetism from adsorbed molecular O2. Now, I, I remember you know, when I was in the Clark group, and uh, Dale and John and Britton were talking about noise and this mysterious flux noise problem. You know, uh, it had been suggested long, long time ago that, oh yeah, okay, oxygen's paramagnetic, your vacuum Christ, that's not so good, maybe it's oxygen. Um, so that idea was kind of floating around out there, but the funny thing is, you know, in the 10 or so year span that I'd worked on that uh, problem at Wisconsin, I talked to many leading surface scientists and, uh, you know, most of them told me that, no, you're not going to get adsorbed O2. You're not going to get oxygen on the surface when you cool these devices in a vacuum crust. So, but anyway, here we had some, uh, some uh, clear evidence that uh, we at least had the oxygen there. Now, uh, the natural next uh, conclusion is to think that this is, the, this is the source of the noise. Now, what do we know about oxygen, uh, solid molecular oxygen? Uh, low temperature, low pressure. It's, it's a total mess. The phase diagram is a mess. There are competing phases, some with uh, uh, long range magnetic order. Uh, oxygen, as uh, Steve Gervin remind me, reminded me, in the early days of uh, quantum chemistry, uh, it was Van Vleck who explained the uh, uh, magnetism of uh, molecular O2. It's a spin one uh, triplet. And uh, Okay, so we know that this uh, oxygen is there. From our X-ray measurements, uh, the amount of oxygen is something like one or two adsorbed monolayers of what is what we end up with. It's going down on a disordered surface. So, you know, I think it's natural to think that uh, you've got, due to the surface disorder, um, competing phases, maybe some ferromagnetic, maybe some paramagnetic, and it's maybe fluctuations of these domain sizes that are giving you the, the measured flux noise. Anyway, here again we had uh, kind of a handle on this problem and we had a direction. And uh, so after this uh, series of x-ray measurements, uh, in my mind our, our task was to find a way to eliminate these magnetic adsorbates and, and clean up the surface, cool down in a, a clean vacuum environment. So I'm uh, running a little bit short on time, and I'll, I'll just tell you that we, after multiple iterations, we did come up with a, a nice way to package devices, achieve a UHV uh, environment, or near UHV for squid devices that we uh, measure at low temperature. And uh, we uh, have shown very uh, large suppressions of uh, surface spin susceptibility of appropriately treated uh, devices packaged in these enclosures. And now for the first time, we've seen suppressions of the, the low frequency flux noise. So uh, there's a path forward to uh, reducing this noise. Uh, I think we're not ready to declare complete victory in this problem, but uh, I feel good about where we are. And uh, there have been some very interesting theory developments from Claire Yu, Rushen Wu at Irvine. The Livermore group is doing DFT. Now that there's a microscopic model, you can go and you can calculate things. And I'm very optimistic about the prospects of really arriving at a detailed microscopic model of, of this noise. And uh, Faro and Yafe in particular uh, have emphasized the importance of the fact that oxygen is spin one, because you've got a spin one particle, not spin one half, this uh, anisotropy energy plays a role. And it's random uh, on-site anisotropy that can explain some of the very puzzling features of the noise correlations between susceptibility and magnetization noise that we've observed in experiment. They're very difficult to uh, uh, explain in other, uh, other types of model. 
So um, quite recently and in my last few minutes, we've uh, taken these techniques, we've adapted them to qubit measurements. We're looking at Ramsey fringes, looking at the dependence of uh, defacing rate on uh, where we bias these flux tunable qubits. And we see that the defacing is indeed due to a, a flux-like noise. And uh, the experiment that we're doing right now, it's, uh, it's based on this uh, earlier very beautiful work from uh, Will Oliver and the, uh, the MIT group. Uh, it allows you to do very high bandwidth measurements of flux noise using a kind of a Ramsey spectroscopy. And the basic idea is you're doing this time series of projective measurements. You can do that really quickly. Then you take the time series and you split it into two interleaved series and take the cross spectrum. And that allows you to uh, you know, average out the quantization noise and extract uh, uh, the one over F spectrum and uh, you know, beat down the noise floor. So I purposely not labeled these traces because uh, uh, you know, this is preliminary data. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing some interesting effects of surface treatment. But uh, you know, there's more work to be done. This is a cool down that we had to kind of terminate uh, prematurely because uh, the student and postdoc wanted to go home for Christmas, which happens sometimes. But uh, we've, we're, we've cooled down again in the last week. And I think we're really going to get to the bottom of this very soon. So uh, here are the players uh, that were involved in this squid work and oxygen and flux noise suppression. Uh, we've had long-standing collaborations with Britton, Martinez, Farrell, and Yaffe. Recently been working uh, with the, the Livermore group more closely. And so here's the sort of technical bullet points. And uh, you know, I feel good about where we are with this problem. There's more work to be done, but uh, I think we're, we're getting there finally after some decades. And uh, in conclusion, I just want to thank John. Uh, I think the, the seven or so years, six and a half, seven years I spent in Berkeley, really uh, some of the best years of my life. And I, I look back on them with great pleasure. And it's uh, a lot of fun to work in this field with all of John's uh, former students and alums and people that he's uh, touched over the years. And uh, anyway, thank you very much again, John. Uh, questions? Um, uh, I have a question. So you're saying that if you get rid of all the oxygen, then you'll get down to that beautiful noise floor that uh, Fred was showing us? The one in that slide? I mean, you'll get well, all the way down there? So, okay, with the squid measurements we've done, we've uh, reduced the 1 over F noise power spectral density at low frequency, 1 hertz or so, by a factor of a few. Now that translates into real significant improvements in defacing times, and that, of course, is going to Im impact uh, gate fidelities if you're uh, talking about a, a qubit circuit. Now it could be that if you get rid of this oxygen on the surface, uh, then you're going to be limited by some other source of flux noise, maybe uh, MIGs at the metal insulator interface, interface between the metal and its native oxide, or the metal and the substrate. We don't know, but the fact that we're able to reduce the noise by you know, factors of a few is telling us that you know, this is the dominant source of the noise. And you know, again, uh, we, we see in the spectroscopy, the X-ray spectroscopy, clear evidence of oxygen. We can't you know, definitively say that the oxygen is the source of the noise, but I think it's natural to make that connection. There could be some other type of magnetic adsorbate. And by doing UV irradiation or this vacuum encapsulation, maybe there's some other bad actor that we're uh, suppressing. So anyway, we're making things better. And you, know, you, you eliminate one source of noise, and then you, you encounter some other source of noise. And the quest for coherence never ends. Is, uh, Gervin's law tells us you, you always have to do better and better. Uh, I had a question. In um, disordered spin systems where the interactions are strong enough at some temperature to see the dynamics slowing down, you often see a deviation because of those same interactions from the Curie law where you see like 1 over t to the some exponent less than one. Yeah. How sensitive would you be to such a, or could you see something like that? Well, that's or? an interesting question. And um, so I showed this data on this temperature dependent uh, flux threading the squids. And uh, 
I didn't have a chance to show. I mean, in some cases, we see cusps in this flux as we cool down low temperatures. So that was in our 08 PRL. We showed one of these cusp-like features. And so, you know, that immediately makes you think of uh, uh, spin glass freezing. And in, in other uh, devices, we've seen so, sort of funny rounding features and some uh, hysteresis in these curves. But, um, and these are things that I've discussed at length. This is now going back years with uh, Yaffe and, and Faro. And in the absence of uh, some kind of microscopic model, I think it's just hard to, to really try to get a handle and uh, even begin to think seriously about how to explain these features. But now that we're, we're focused on oxygen, I mean, maybe we can, I, I would like to go back and revisit some of this earlier data that we have and uh, evaluate it in the, in the light of this new information. Um, any other uh, questions? Oh, I see one. Uh, David? <clears throat> so, uh, so in an alternative to, uh, um, to packaging in a UHV environment um, might be to encapsulate the system. Yes. Would, would you have other problems if you do that? Um, well, that, and that's abs you're absolutely right, and that's a great idea. It's something we've thought about. It's even something that we've tried in kind of a naive way. Uh, the encapsulation, if, if we're interested in getting rid of adsorbates, the encapsulation is going to need to be thick enough so that the adsorbates are, are moved to a point where the fields that are generated by currents in the device loop are so small that the, the coupling of the spins to the loop is suppressed to a level that's acceptable. Um, so. You know, you can think about ways to do that. The thing that we tried, we tried to encapsulate a device <clears throat> in APA's own wax, a big blob of wax on top of a squid. And uh, we measured the noise, and the noise was the same. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I mean, it could be that stuff is somehow diffusing through the wax or getting under there. So, I don't know. But it's, it's absolutely an interesting direction. Um, the other consideration that you have to uh, worry about is that, you know, to make a qubit, you don't care just about magnetic noise, but you care very much about dielectric loss. And so whatever you're putting on top of the squid, uh, you're going to need to make sure that that's not going to degrade qubit uh, coherence by introducing another, uh, you know, sort of dielectric bath that the qubit can give energy to. All right. Uh Let's let's thank Robert again. One more.